All right. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us out in Facebook land. We are live today with our guest astronomer, Bill Burnett, uh, for Ask an Astronomer. Um, if you don't know who I am, I am the uh, program coordinator at Whistler Public Library, Jeanette Bruce. Um, and I would like to acknowledge today that um, my gratitude that we're able to gather on the shared traditional unceded territories of the Squamish Nation and the Lilwat Nation, at least from my kitchen, <laughs> we are on those territories. Uh, Bill is in a slightly different location, um, but I would just like to express my gratitude that we're able to live, work, and play on these territories. Oh, look, we have a guest in the back. <laughs> That happens sometimes. Um, so the way today will work is that we have some questions prepared for Bill, but we are also taking questions from live participants. So if you are watching on Facebook, you can comment and we will uh, pass your question along to Bill. Um, but we've got a great array of questions that may, in fact, address all of your burning questions for our guest astronomer. Um, so Bill, before we answer any questions, um, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Well, thanks, Jeanette. Thanks for having me here at the Whistler Library. Um, although I'm not really at the library, I'm pretending to be at the library. But um, uh, I've been uh, uh, in education and astronomy for a long time, about 30 years. I was uh, I worked for the Macmillan Planetarium for more than 20 years doing outreach astronomy. And I'm um, also at uh, British Columbia Institute of Technology, BCIT, um, I, which I operate a planetarium they have there. And um, also take telescopes to parks um, during the summertime to uh, do what's called community astronomy. So telescopes in the parks. But um, la this summer I haven't had been able to do that at all for reasons which you probably will uh, understand. So I'm taking a break. But um, since um, it's still the case that people have questions about astronomy and interest in astronomy, and you can do astronomy uh, by social distancing, being outside by yourself with no one else around and looking up at the sky. So that's something that can be done by everyone. So it's, there's still a role. And so this new technology is a way for us to uh, give a little bit of direction as to what you might want to do next time you're outside, it's night and you're looking up at the stars. Wonderful. Well, let's dive into our first question, shall we, Bill? Okay. Um, first on the list is, what are some of the common constellations you would be able to see in Whistler? Okay. Well, the answer to that is um, I use a little star wheel to find that out. This uh, the star wheel is a piece of uh, paper with a wheel inside it which turns. The hours of the evening are around here, and then the days of the year are in black. And I simply turn it and I've turned it to match around um, late September uh, to around nine o'clock. So this gives the sky at nine o'clock at Whistler, right, looking kind of south. And in the sky, we see a few common constellations. In the western part of the sky, going down are three bright stars called Vega, Deneb, and Eltair, and they make up the summer triangle. So Vega is very bright and uh, Deneb not so bright, but they make a triangle with Eltair. And Altair is an interesting star because there's a star above it and below it. So there's a little trio of stars in the sky fairly down to the south. And if you take a close look at the little star that's above Altair, it's not very bright, but I call it a pumpkin colored star. And that it's pumpkin colored because I, I guess because um, Halloween comes and I've already seen pumpkins around. So we have our own pumpkin star in the sky. So I suggest checking it out. If you have a pair of binoculars or a little telescope, that's even better because it's easy to see the pumpkin colored star. Now, also in the south, getting kind of low in the sky, if you look down the valley from Whistler towards where the highway goes, not to the sides, which are of course full of mountains and stuff, but down there south, you'll see two objects that are close together. The bright one is the planet Jupiter and the not so bright one to the left is a planet Saturn. So they're visible as the sun is going down. Now this, these pair of planets, Jupiter and Saturn, they go around and around the sun. And every 20 years, Jupiter catches up to Saturn and passes it, right? So like a fast car passing a slow car on a racetrack. So this will happen uh, at the end of December. So the two 
um, objects will be very close together in the sky um, and in towards the rest of the year, but you won't actually be able to see them very close together because the sun will come up and hide them. However, um, next year, the, their positions will be reversed and Jupiter will be on the left of Saturn in the morning sky um, because uh, Jupiter has caught its uh, companion Saturn and passed it. So those are the things happening on the western part of the sky. Now, if you move a little bit toward the east, high up, there's a very, very bright object. And that is the planet Mars. Now, Mars, it looks sort of orangey. Sometimes it's called the red planet, but that's not a very accurate uh, description of its uh, color. If you can compare it with a red laser pointer, you'll see that Mars is not really that color at all. It's far more um, orangey or golden color. Uh, gold and copper, something like that, kind of like a copper kettle. If you've ever seen uh, one of those like old fashioned, like retro made copper kettles and they're sort of what well, they're sort of what sort of orangey uh, gold and in, in that, that's sort of what, what, what uh, the planet Mars looks like. In a telescope, like the small one behind me here, I think you can see now there's a, there's a telescope with a white tube there. Well, Mars looks like a kind of like a red or orange grape right, with little indistinct markings on it, and on the top, it has a polar ice cap. So uh, Mars, just like the Earth, is snowy on the top and the bottom, right, and so if you were there, you would be able to ski, but it would be different than here, right, not very, no, not the same, because first of all, the um, ice is very, very thin. It's sort of like a skiff on top of it, like a, like a couple of inches right on top of a parking lot. It would be like that because Mars is very, very, very dry. So it doesn't have a lot of snow, but it does have some snow. Another thing is you might want to um, you know, make sure you have two ski jackets on, right? And two pairs of boots and like 10 pairs of socks because the temperature there might be like minus 60 Celsius. And that, that's kind of cold, right? So um, it is very, very cold on Mars. Why? Because Mars is further away from the sun than the Earth is. So it gets less sunlight and um, as a result uh, it, it can be kind of chilly. In the summertime at the equator on Mars it might be um, you know might be the temperatures we have here um, but um, usually and, and almost invariably Mars is very very cold. The planet has been explored by spacecraft going back to the 1960s and before that time it was thought maybe Mars had life on it, life on Mars. How many people have heard of life on Mars? Yeah, I see people putting their hands up, yes. So that's right, but turns out, big disappointment. The uh, life on Mars didn't pan out. So there were no Martians or things like that. One of the reasons for the belief in life on Mars came about because uh, when astronomers drew pictures of Mars, they had little lines on the pictures and these lines came to be called canals. They're like channels. And some people thought, well, they must've been made by the Martians, right? Like a Martian ministry of highways, right? They're getting there and they're plowing away, making a big canal. However, when, fo when photographs came, when spacecraft went to Mars, these channels or grooves or lines were no longer seen. Now, many years ago, I made a kind of an interesting experiment. What I did is I had some grade five students, a whole class of them, and I projected with a slide projector a little picture of Mars on a, on a, a wall, right? And then I gave them all pieces of paper, which I had drawn a big circle on, and then pencils, and I asked them to draw a picture of Mars. And when they did that, I found the canals were back. In other words, even though there were no canals or lines on the picture of Mars, the students drew them right, by, on their paper. Now, why is this? Well, it has to do something to do with, with, the cog, with cognition. In other words, it's really a, uh, an issue in perceptual psychology. Rather, that's a big couple of big words, but you know what I mean, right? It's our minds that make the canals there. And so that's why the kids made these lines on, on their paper but there were no lines in the picture. So I got so that I could tell what they were going to draw just by setting up the equipment in the right way. So um, in other words, the canals on Mars are not a reality. And when spacecraft got to Mars, they found out that Mars is, is a lot like the moon. It's sort of it's got craters on it and um, 
uh, and, and mountains and things, but it's very dry and dusty. And uh, you know, if you went there, you wouldn't see anything that was familiar on the earth. No plants, no animals, no trees, no uh, ice cream, no coffee, no stuff like that. You know, I wouldn't want to go there myself. So Mars, however, Mars can be seen well in little telescopes. And I think because the earth is so cool, let's stay put. Right? I don't have any uh, uh, desire to go to Mars, okay? It's not very nice, but it can be seen as really neat in a little telescope such as we have here. And so that's the way to observe Mars or the moon or things like that. And uh, that's what I prefer to do. So all these objects, um, many of them are inaccessible, like the distant stars. Um, we'll never be able to get there, but we can enjoy them right here, right? From our own backyards, right? Or even by looking through the window. Right, and seeing a star in the sky. But uh, the first thing to do is to get to know the names of the stars. So the ones that I mentioned, Vega, Deneb, and Altair, the Summer Triangle, and then crawling up on the east, other objects, but the main one to, to uh, see and recognize is, um, uh, is the planet Mars. And so there's, um, there's sort of a rundown of what we can see right now. Now, naturally, if I was talking to you in February or March, there'd be a different bunch coming up, then we'd have the constellation Orion. Right, which is a winter constellation, which we never see in the summer, unless you're up at uh, before dawn. So um, this is what I'm saying is just for the next little while. And then at, about, at Christmas time, we'll have to reset the clock and talk about different objects. Now, Bill, yeah. would you say that you have a favorite time of year to go stargazing? If there are in fact different things to see, um, and I'm also wondering about timing of the night. What, what time do you choose to go stargazing? Well, that's a good question. The, um, um, as for the seasons, every season has its own little delight. So just like in wintertime, we can go see, uh, skiing, but in the summertime, we might want to go mountain biking, right, down the same path because there's no snow there. But it's not that mountain biking is better than skiing or vice versa. It's just that they're different. So the seasons for the stars are different. In the summertime, you have the summer Milky Way and can see things at some distance away. But in the winter sky, the sky is more immediate and closer by. We're seeing a closer section of the Milky Way. So the winter sky with Orion and uh, the dog star and, uh, and groups like that, they're very interesting as well. And you don't need large telescopes. A pair of binoculars can show many of these things. So there's just differences. The spring has the lion. And that's where galaxies are, right? So we can see very exotic objects in the spring and the fall as well um, has a great square of Pegasus and the Andromeda galaxy is on view. So there's, a, there's another one that's, that's quite a interest. So every season is unique, just like the seasons are unique on the earth and the sky seasons repeat themselves in the same cycle as the earth season. So they're sort of in, in, um, in sync with each other. In fact, the ancients used to think that the passage of the seasons and the changes on the earth were caused by the stars. So it was the stars that did that. So when Arcturus, the spring star gets up, that tells all the flowers to start popping up out of the ground and become flowery. Now that's not really what happens, but it's kind of a cool idea. Um, now, Bill, I know we could probably have a whole talk about this next question, but can you briefly tell us how a telescope actually works? That's, that's another good question. And to f facilitate that, um, I, I've sort of made a telescope in the last couple of days. Now telescopes are, are sometimes, if you go into a telescope store, you'll find there are computer mounts, there are iPads which control telescopes, and, and they're very complicated. The thing is very intimidating, but that needn't be the case. I was given um, a pair of binoculars a while ago, and these binoculars um, had been um, used by a two-year-old. That's right. And then they ended up being thrown out a window. So inside they're all smashed up. And so what I did was I took the big end of the binoculars and I unscrewed the lens. And here it is right here. So this is the unscrewed lens of an ordinary pair of binoculars. I just screwed it out. Now, the eyepiece is where you look through. And I also unscrewed the eyepiece. So there's the eyepiece of our broken pair of binoculars. They'll never work again. Thanks to the two-year-old. Okay, so there we go. Now, if I hold this to my eye and hold this out in front, 
I'm going to be magnifying and seeing things just like they were when they were a pair of binoculars. But of course, I don't want to hold them like that. So what to do? So I went to a uh, one of those big box stores that sells lots of stuff and bought this. So this is a piece of uh, two inch diameter piping. It's like, uh, um, well, piping that you use in the bathroom, right? And it has a nice little lid on there, it's on screws. So now what I do is I put the end of the binocular in here and yeah, put it back on, let's do that. And there we are. So now this is in here, just like before, a little, a little bit clumsy. And then I put the eyepiece in the other end, right through there, right? And then I have another piece that goes in here and that holds them steady. So a telescope is just a tube that holds lenses steady. And that's what we have here. Now we have a little telescope. To find out how much it magnifies, um, if I didn't know, which, which I already did know, but supposing I didn't, I took the lens outside and held it up at the sun and focused the sun until it was a tiny dot on a piece of paper. And then I measured that distance and it came out to about eight inches or 200 millimeters. So that means this is a 200 millimeter lens. The eyepiece is 28 and a half millimeters. So dividing 200 by 28.5 gives us seven. So we have a seven power telescope. So this telescope was built by the, thanks to the great, the two-year-old, right? Uh, handling the binoculars very poorly, right? And um, a piece of tube, this tubing is sold at about $4 a foot and I needed an eight inch piece. So I, you can work that out. I spent about $3. So this is a $3 telescope. Now the $3 telescope will show um, lots and lots of things that the eye can't see. In fact, it's really surprising. If you look at something with a little telescope and then you look um, just with your eye and how much larger and more detail you see with it. There is one proviso though. What you're seeing is upside down. And this is how the optical system works. But for astronomy, that doesn't matter because the sky is not right side up or upside down. Right? So it's just for the stars. If you're looking at something on the ground, to see it right side up, you'd have to stand on your head while looking. Right? So, um, so what you do is you take this outside and you look around at the bright stars and focus it so that the stars don't look big, but like tiny little itty bitty points. Right? And then you can see things like Altair and see the colors of the stars. Because the lens is big, this is two inches across, right? And your eye is small, you're now seeing lots and lots of more light getting through. Just like a deer has, uh, has big eyes and can see in the dark better than we can, right? So then you're seeing more light getting through and magnifying it and you have yourself a little astronomical telescope. Now, of course, it doesn't take the place of big uh, telescope that you might spend a couple of thousand dollars on, which is not unusual today, but, um, this telescope will get you off the ground and it's kind of fun. So um, you take it outside, you scan the uh, uh, area around Vega, Deneb and Altair, seeing the colors of the stars, look for the pumpkin colored star above the bright star um, Altair, and then Mars. Mars, of course, will look kind of orangey. Many of the things are colorless, but you can see the Andromeda galaxy and uh, little patches of light here and there, which are star clusters. And the little telescope, even though it seems modest, it gathers an awful lot more light than your eye. So you can see thousands and thousands of stars that are fainter than your eye can see. And in Whistler, you have a big advantage because it's easy to get somewhere where it's nice and dark. So where you, uh, when you decide to go outside and look around, choose a place that's far away from the, the city lights. Like the center of the village would not be the best place. Some place like Alpine or something. Sometimes I go out in, uh, uh, in the lane at Alpine, and there's no street lights, right? So I can just look around and can see the Milky Way and everything like that uh, from, uh, from that position. There's a good spot, but there are lots of other places around town that are like that. Just avoid the center and, and staying near the edge, right? And then you'll find a, uh, a spot where you can do your astronomy. No car headlights, no street lights, and the sky is nice and clear. So that's, that's a prerequisite. And as I've just showed, you don't need to spend a lot of money. Um, uh, you can do astronomy on a, on a shoestring. It's much cheaper than doing many other types of things.
And of course, okay. this is a good time to plug the fact that the library has a telescope <laughs> that right. that folks mm -hmm. can borrow, um, just like a book or a DVD. Um, if mm -hmm. you search for telescope in our catalog on our website, you will see uh, the, the telescope come up. And um, our friend Bill here has actually serviced this telescope for us. So so we know but it, still, it still works. So. <laughs> It's been in good hands. Um, so we don't, you know, kids at home, you don't need to break your parents' binoculars. <laughs> um, and by the way, we, I see that there are some, some people who've joined us on Facebook. Please don't be shy. You can submit your questions in the Facebook comments um, and Bill will answer them if you, if you um, ask them in our, during our live session. Um, but I will continue with my questions. <laughs> so okay. uh, next up, um, oh, Next up is Bill, a personal preference question. Do you have a favorite star or celestial body or constellation? Well, um, let's see. Um, I, I guess the moon is pretty hard to beat. Um, so I like looking at the moon. Uh, in fact, with the little telescope that I demonstrated, you can see some craters on the moon. So it looks a lot larger and uh, more detailed than just with the unaided eye. Sometimes I take um, uh, my, a, pen, a pencil outside with a, a notepad on a clipboard and I draw the moon so I can make a picture of the moon um, by making a circle like the bottom of a, of a drinking glass, draw that outline on a page. And then outside I go and I look at the moon in a telescope like the one behind me or a little telescope and sketch what I see. And it's a good way of getting to know the moon. If you draw it, uh, you're more intimately connected with it. Um, anyone can see a picture of the moon. If you go online, you can see pictures of moons by the thousand. But if you actually draw it, if you're actually outside interacting with the moon, then it's going to be a lot more meaningful. So what I do is I have a, uh, if I can get one, oh, just to grab over here. I should have, uh, should have sorted this out before. Oh, here we are. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that, Jeanette. I should have grabbed this before. Okay. Can everyone see this? Okay. Can. Uh... Okay. My audio is still on, or didn't? Okay. Yeah, you bet. It looks great. <laughs> okay, so what I did was I went outside uh, where that tree was. I knew the moon would be there. All right? So I drew the tree in the daytime with the branches hanging down. And then when the moon was out, I had made a, a pencil sketch of the moon with some of its darker areas. The darker areas are called Maria. And the really dark areas are some of the brighter craters on the moon. So I know it's not a great work of art, obviously, but it is... Um, it is what I see on the moon at 20 power in a small telescope. And notice how one edge there's little circles there. Those are some of the craters of the moon, uh, which are um, highlighted. Right? So there's a little art project for someone that just all you need is a uh, is a clipboard and uh, a pair, uh, a sheet of artist paper, right? And some different density uh, pencils, like as well as the HB, then uh, the darker pens, so that you can sketch and maybe smear it a little bit. To, to fill in the, the gaps. All right, so there's a, uh, there's a project that doesn't require um, any, any equipment or, you know, or you know, money or anything like that. This is just a, uh, a fun thing to do. Go outside at night and draw the moon. See how good, you can get pretty good at it after a while. Some people are so good, they can draw a pretty amazing planet Saturn with the ring around it, right, from the telescope. But, th but that, that's, for, that's for really practice people. That's a more okay. advanced exercise. Yes. <laughs> um, well, um, we are getting close to 4.30. Oh my goodness, I can't believe how quickly the time is going. Um, well, my uh, next question for you is more of a, a, I guess, a personal history question, which is, um, how did you get interested in astronomy, Bill? Well, hmm. I guess, um, uh, as is often the case, um, it, it was um, a, a book Find the Constellations by H.A. Ray, which that book might be in the library. The call number for astronomy books in nonfiction is 520. 
So if you go into the um, nonfiction section of the library and look at the numbers on them, when you get to 520, stop and look, right? The library has far more books than any one individual can. So it's a good place to begin your interest in astronomy. Go to the library, go to the 520s, take a look, see what's there and pull them out. Generally, there's two types of astronomy books. There are books about the planets and books about the stars. And, and so the topic sort of breaks down into those uh, two types. So take a star book and a planet book and then uh, sit at the, at the, maybe at the tables and read away. So um, that is how I got started in astronomy. I wanted to know the constellations and I got interested in space. When I was young, I mean, it was like, you know, like in the last century, <laughs> so, um, there was um, the, the space program was in operation. And so there was quite a lot of excitement generated about space travel and things like that. Um, now this is still ongoing, but really the um, astronomy is, is actually more today, for, at least for the general public, astronomy is not a practice of a science, but it's more like yoga or something like that. It's kind of a recreation. Right? So um, it's, a, it's a pleasant way to spend time and you get to know the constellations and know the objects in there, know a little bit about them. Right? It makes it richer to understand exactly what it is you're looking at. And also um, some of the history of, of observation. Now, now objects don't have histories. Um, that was uh, Mr. Hegel told us that. But what they do have is histories of our interactions with them. So you can learn about how William Herschel found the planet Uranus. He was the first person to discover a, a new planet, right, back in the 1700s. He made his own telescope, just like I did today, right, and uh, found another planet. So, um, uh, you know, and there's also Hubble, the fellow the telescope is named after. Uh, he found out that galaxies are moving away from us. How was that done? Well, that's an interesting story in itself. And, uh, and one that uh, is, uh, is, many, uh, is written about in many, many chronicles. So my interest grew out of an interest in all of these things together. There wasn't one thing that stood out. It was a whole landscape of objects and landscape of themes and things like that. So science, uh, telescope making involves many arts, even chemistry, right? To, to figure out what to put on the mirror of the telescope. So all these things kind of dovetail and astronomy is the oldest of the sciences. So there were astronomers before there were uh, chemists and um, uh, physicists or any of these groups like that. The ancient Greeks had their own astronomers and wrote, they wrote about astronomy as well. The phenomenon of Eratus, he was a Greek writer. It's um, sort of a rundown of what the constellations are like. If you get a translation of it, that's just as good as anything I can tell you, right? So in other words, the stars aren't that different over time. They are a perennial, whereas the things that are around us come and go, right? Like cars going along the road. So we don't have any permanent things in our field of view, except the stars. That's, a, that's an incredible thought, Bill, that it's a way to connect us to history. And yes. we can know that looking at the night sky and Whistler has looked the same for for generations and generations. That's that's yeah. very cool. Um, well, our friends on Facebook are being shy, <laughs> but I, okay. um, since it's almost 430, I will ask you um, the final question on my list, um, which is, uh, what is the most unusual or unique uh, an astronomical event you have personally ever seen? Well, in the 1980s, there was a very bright fireball scene and uh, we were um, at the H.R. McMillan Planetarium behind the big observatory building. And uh, we walked out and just at that moment, it, it seemed like there was a flare in the sky. And um, sometimes these things seem to be quite nearby. So there was a big uh, flare, it shot through the air and uh, and then burst as a big, uh, big ball of light. But the idea that it was nearby was, is not really the way it was because this, uh, this was seen in Portland, Oregon and in, um, in Washington state and in Alberta at the same time. So it was a rock that had entered the Earth's atmosphere and burned up. Now, this is not an unusual event. Every year there are shooting star displays 
But if the object is big enough, then it might come all the way through the atmosphere and plop onto the ground. And uh, I have one of these right here. This, um, this strange looking rock, it doesn't look all that unusual, but if you could hold it in your hand, let's see, if you could hold it in your hand, I think you might be surprised. It's very heavy. It's like a block of steel about the same size. And it's, a, it's an iron nickel meteorite from space. So this body was going around and around the sun for a long time, like billions of years. And then suddenly the earth was, was right in front of it and it came whistling through the earth's atmosphere, getting very hot and then bursting. And that little rock was part of the fragments that were, um, were left over. Now, in the uh, 1950s and 60s, in uh, in uh, in the prairies, they used to have a, a network of observers. People would sit on like on lawn lawn chairs and look up at the sky, and they would record the presence of shooting stars on a map. Now, if two stations see the same shooting star, right, and they know the distance between the two stations and the shooting star is up here, then that makes a triangle. Now, what do we know about triangles? Can't we solve their size by Side by trigonometry. Yeah, that's right. So that's exactly what was done. And then it was could be found out where is the shooting star going? And sometimes teams were sent to look for it. And often, sometimes they were successful, sometimes they weren't. There was a very bright one that happened about 20 years ago, and the shooting star was coming over British Columbia and it was heading in the direction of Vancouver Island. And somebody thought that maybe it might have hit the mountains. Um, on Vancouver Island and some and a team could go there and find it or at least look for it. But we had bad luck because it actually was a little bit higher than that and it went whistling right over Vancouver Island and into the Pacific Ocean and splashed down and uh, so it was never seen again. But every year the earth gets about a, um, heavier by about a million tons because rocks from space fall on it. Most of them um, are like this or harmless. Every once in a while, a good sized object comes through. And I got an email this morning saying that um, in the next couple of days, a rock about the size of a minivan is coming back uh, past the earth at a distance of about 20,000 kilometers. So um, we now have cameras that look out into space and can find objects uh, that are small like this, whereas this used to go by invisibly but now we can see where these things are. So that's, that was kind of a unique thing. <laughs> yes, that sounds very unique. Um, well, Bill, I'm, I'm going to sneak one more question in because uh, I, I mentioned before we went live that I, I was kind of curious about this one. Um, what does a stargazer do on a rainy day like today? Well, hmm. Um, on a rainy day. I suppose the answer is you can plan new things, uh, plan where the objects are in the sky are going to be, and then plan to go out and look for them. Another thing to do is to read uh, books on astronomy. So um, sometimes, like when I used to travel around the province in a van with telescopes, if the day was rainy and all, all we could do is sit inside the van, then I would read uh, Burnham's Celestial Handbook, which is a big three volume heavy book. Um, and it deals with all the constellations. There's 88 constellations and they're listed alphabetically like in an encyclopedia. So I would just open one of those books at random and, and read about a constellation. So I guess we didn't have much to do, but we mainly worked hard at night and in the day we just sort of hung around places. Well, folks, if you want to fill up, follow Bill's advice um, on the rainy days that are coming up this week, um, if you go to our website and search, simply search the word astronomy, you'll see um, a whole bunch of books come up in that category. And you can filter them by audience if you are at home watching with kids. Um, you can filter by age. Um, I think there's something for everybody in there. So uh, this is a good way for you to stay productive during these uh during these rainy days waiting for a clear night. Um, well, I think that wraps up our session for today. Um, thank you to everybody who's watching on thank Facebook. You. And thank you to Bill. And um, we will say, oh, before I go, <laughs> I don't wanna forget this. Um, we are actually gonna have Bill back 
for another event on Tuesday, October 6th. Um, this one is geared more towards adults, but it will be called Stargazing in the Mountains. And Bill will be kind of presenting a Stargazing 101 um, for folks who are here in Whistler and looking to get started on this, uh, on this new hobby. Um, so that's seven o'clock on Tuesday, October 6th. You can email me at jbruce at whistlerlibrary.ca to register, or you can join us live on Facebook, just like you may be doing right now. Um, but with that, I will say our final farewell to our friends on Facebook and uh, a final thank you to Bill. Well, thanks very much for having me. And thanks everyone for uh, taking part. <laughs>